If you've got a web application that has any type of data that you need to store, it's pretty f common that you're going to need some kind of user management. You're going to have to be able to authenticate users. Uh, fortunately, this is a pretty easy thing to do in the custom way. This is probably the most straightforward way to manage users in your application. So. The one thing to keep in mind is that users are just data. You know, most of the things you're going to deal with in your application, whether they are images or text or, you know, inputs or users or, or anything really, those are all going to be data. So we can represent users as database records or as data store entities. And all we have to do is think about how we manage that user data, think about what kind of data needs to be associated and what those associations are. So a user can be stored, updated, modified, deleted, you know, just like any data that's out there, and if you think about the, the applications that you use, a lot of times you can go into the application and you can enter your username, you can enter a, a password, you can enter an email address. Maybe there's some other demographic information, maybe there's like an about me section on, on, that or on your user page, but all of that is just data. So it's just data that happens to be associated with a particular user. So as long as you're collecting and storing data on users, you can use this particular user entity uh, for authentication purposes. So when you're creating users, probably the simplest way to do this is just ask the user for a username and either generate a password or ask the user to enter the password. So usually entering the password is, is pretty straightforward. You can ask the user to choose a username. You can ask the user to enter uh, a password. Oftentimes when you create a user account, you want to have a second field just so that you can verify that the user has entered the same password two times. Uh, this is a pretty common way to approach this. You might also want uh, other information identifying areas like name, phone number, address, other information. You know, maybe there's a link to a website. There's a whole variety of things that you can use to collect information and to use uh, to apply that for your website uh, about users. But really for authentication purposes, you need something to identify the user, which is going to be your username or email, and you need a password. Now, when you design your user entity, you can always ask for more information later. You know, but once you have that username and password or an email address and password, you can identify the user and you can give them that sort of secret thing that allows them to, uh, to get access to your application. So uh, you can collect that information in form fields. There is a password type on, a, on input fields in HTML so that you don't have to show those characters on the screen. It doesn't really provide a ton of security, but it does give you the ability to not echo those characters back on the screen. Uh, you probably want to check for uniqueness uh, if you have a username as your identifier, you want to make sure that users are picking unique uh, usernames. Otherwise, you'll run into lots of problems. If you're using email addresses, you probably want to make sure that users are using unique email addresses. You probably also want to normalize those so that you don't end up with uh, different characters. Like generally, sites will allow you to enter a username, but when they store that information, they might convert it all to lowercase and they might remove spaces. They might trim that. That way, you don't have to worry about somebody entering a username and then maybe somebody using the same username but with a capital letter or somebody using a username with a space at the end. You know, all of these things can cause problems. So you definitely want to make sure that that username or that email address is unique. And email addresses are a little bit challenging because sometimes you can, in different email systems, you can enter variations to, to use the same email address. That may or may not be a problem for your application, but it's good to think about how you can simplify and normalize this data. Uh, so, you know, sort of clean this data so that you can make sure that that, that particular data point is unique. Uh, you know, keys in the cloud data store will allow you to maintain uniqueness. So there's really not a whole lot of concerns about making the username a key on that entity. And that way you get some of that uniqueness, some of that checking for free, which might make things simpler. So once you've collected all of this, once you've created your entity, you just have to store that data. Now, one thing to keep in mind is you never want to store or log passwords. This is usually a good idea because if you have any type of breach at any point, you can reduce the ability for anyone to access uh, user data by using you know, this sort of approach. So you never want to log or store a raw password. This is just safer for users. It makes everybody feel better. And we can actually authenticate without ever storing a real password. And the way that you do this is you use a hash code. So if you took a data structures class, you probably went through the process of learning what a hash function is. And all a hash function does is it takes some kind of data and then converts that to a numeric or you know basically numeric uh, you know output. And a hash code just takes something and it, it uses some mathematical operation to to create this output number. And the number itself doesn't really matter that much. You know that you don't actually the number itself doesn't have to have any meaning. But the purpose is that if someone gives you a password and you create a hash code from that password 
password and you store that, that hash code, then when the user comes back to authenticate, they can enter the same password, use the same hash code mechanism, and if the user is authenticated properly, then those hash codes will match. So in Python, there's a built-in hash function. It's a very simple way to do this. It's probably not the best possible way to do this, but hashlib in, in the hashlib Python module has a lot of options there. Now what some people will do is they'll they'll take a, the, the password and maybe they'll add some data to it, they'll append something to the end, or maybe they'll prepend something so that that way, even if somebody knows your hash mechanism, uh, that sort of secret extra word, they, they, that's often called a salt, uh, will allow, you know, sort of a different hash output. So you, you can't sort of reverse engineer the hash codes that effectively in this approach. And one thing to keep in mind is that if there's a breach, often that's a data breach. It doesn't necessarily mean your code is leaked. It doesn't necessarily mean that logs are leaked. It doesn't necessarily mean the way that you've you've uh, built your, your data, your data storage has leaked. So that raw data is really the thing that you want to be the most concerned about. So hash codes will protect your users from ever having their passwords leaked. Most people use passwords for a variety of different sites and this makes it possible for you to, to authenticate users without actually having to store and you know potentially compromise that user's password. So again, authenticating a user, you collect the password. If you, that's the same password that they entered when they created the account or when they changed their password previously, if that's the same password and you use the same hash code mechanism that you used before, then you're going to end up with the same matching output hash code. So if you use your, your data store query, you uh, look up on the, or you look up a username or you access a key, you check to see if the hash code that was entered is the same as the password hash that uh, you have stored, then the user is authenticated. If it's not a match, then the user's entered an invalid password. So one thing that this prevents you from doing is sending the user the password if they, if they request it. But one thing you can always do is reset the password. You can always just generate a password and then send that to the user. And that way you don't have to worry about this. It kind of absolves you from ever having to really know the user's password in any long-term way. So uh, once you've authenticated a user, you can identify the user in a cookie. Uh, you can use a session to identify the user. And this will have uh, allow you to pr not have to ask the user for authentication over and over again. Once you've authenticated, you can establish a session and then you can kind of treat the user as someone who's already authenticated your application. And you can use the, any information that you associate with the session now to look that user up to access that user, user's details. In fact, you could even store a user that user data itself in some type of session structure so that you can now uh, very directly access who this user is, which is often important for when you're looking up profile pages or when you're looking up what can the user do or where the, you know, a lot of different things you might want to associate with what a user is. So there is a sample custom authorization uh, project in, in the GitHub here. Uh, this is like a this is a, a pretty expansive example. Uh, so you can use this for a lot of different things. You can take a look at the way the the pages are formed. You can look at the authentication. There's a lot of uh, different signals in this this particular application that you know you can take and you can use or you can learn from. But it builds just a simple learning management system that organizes courses and you know it it uses a custom sign up and custom authorization system. So it's it could be useful if you want to build your own authorization uh, to take a look at the way that it's done here. Um, so there is one URL, just to note, this create data URL will sort of uh, seed a bunch of data for this particular application. So once you've started it up and you're running your, your emulator, or if you've deployed it in your own uh, in own, your own app engine instance, uh, if you go to the slash create data URL, that will initialize all of the data. It also uses templates, but it also has some uh, some examples of how you use sessions in uh, Python, Flask, and App Engine. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you'd like to know more. Uh, for now, thanks for watching. Hopefully, you can uh, in integrate uh, custom authorization and uh, sessions into your own applications.